I uh, sort of want to want to begin by by mentioning that some of what I am going to be presented uh, has been published. Uh, it, it, it was published recently, but I took this opportunity to see if I can uh, extend the temporal frame a little bit uh, and uh, ask whether or not there are continuities uh, insofar as one thinks about the role of infrastructure in building connectivities uh, across so-called frontier spaces. Um, so so the, 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 the image that you're that you're seeing on the screen right now, uh, this is uh, it's from the Karakoram region in North Pakistan, and um, I'll be I'll be pulling up a map uh, immediately afterwards, and I'll, I'll I'll point out exactly where this region is located. Um, but but this is it's a it's a it's it's an image uh, that I took in 2014, and I think it it it, it captures some of the the thematics that are at play over here. Uh, this is a, a type of connectivity infrastructure, albeit a slightly unusual one insofar as the Karakoram is concerned. The Karakoram is, is a mountain range. Uh, it's one of the tall mountain ranges in uh, Asia, which is in Pakistan. It extends into China as well. Um, it extends into India too. And what you're seeing on the boat over here uh, are goods which are being uh, shuttled in from, from China. Uh, so there was a moment in between when the Karakoram Highway, which otherwise runs through this landscape, was submerged and people ended up resorting to transporting goods over a body of water uh, using, using, using vessels. So it's, 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 it's evocative, at least in my mind, of the many different ways in which infrastructure presents in this region. Um, this, is, uh, this is a map which primarily shows the uh, current geopolitical borders of, of Pakistan, but there's, there's a couple of things that I want to point out uh, over here which foreground what will, what will follow next. Uh, what is this uh, sort of region that's marked in orange right at the top? Uh, it's marked as Gilgit Baltistan. And this is where the Karakoram Mountains are uh, primarily located. Uh, they, they sort of extend across geopolitical boundaries as well, but, but for the sake of this presentation, uh, when, when one talks about the Karakoram Mountains, one's talking about the region known as Gilgit Baltistan. And then if you look at the top left-hand corner, uh, you'll see a slightly more detailed look uh, at, 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 at Gilgit Baltistan. And the, the, the sort of one thing that I want to point out over here is um, a city called Gilgit. Uh, and this is one place that will come up in today's discussion. And the important thing about Gilgit is that it's the administrative center in the region. So that's, that's the big city, if you may. Uh, then, of course, on the map, you can see the People's Republic of China. You can see Afghanistan. Um, they haven't marked it, but there's the thin panhandle of Afghanistan. And beyond that uh, would, be, would be Tajikistan. So that would be that would be Central Asia as we, as we understand it today. Now, the, the, the final thing that I want to say about this map is that this is showing contemporary geopolitical boundaries, but I think it's also important and useful to uh, think of this region without the geopolitical boundaries. And if you think of this region without the geopolitical boundaries, we're not necessarily thinking of a borderless world. I mean, that's, that's certainly not what I'm implying, but we're thinking then of ways in which Central Asia could be connected to the Indian Ocean world, or we're thinking of ways in which uh, Western China could be connected to the Indian Ocean world, uh, which indeed it was in the 19th century and up until about the middle of the 20th century as well. So for example, there's a pilgrimage route that runs from Kashgar down through what is present-day Pakistan to Karachi from where people would, would go for Hajj, for example. So uh, there's, there's, I think, some utility in being able to erase these geopolitical boundaries, take what's presently on the edge of the map, the Karakoram Pamir watershed, and center that as far as looking at this region is concerned. Just one or two very quick words about the Karakoram Pamir watershed. Uh, Gilgit Baltistan region would be where the Karakoram mountains are on the other side of that dividing line, on the other side of that boundary 
would be would be the Pamirs, the North would be the Pamirs as well. I'm not describing this as um, strictly a geological divide, but I'm really thinking of it more as a zone. Uh, and it's a zone in which there is interaction uh, between people, there is mobility between people, and that mobility is transformed in the 20th century. And that's, that's, one, of the, that's one of the points that I'll be making uh, in, 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 in today's presentation. Um, the, the, the other thing that I want to say uh, is that uh, what, we're, what, we're, what we're looking at is a, a sort of work or it's a story, it's a narrative that's, 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 that's coming out of different types of sources uh, up until about the mid 20th century. Uh, we find that uh, British archival sources uh, are very, very useful and from that point onwards, the archival sources become um, a little less detailed and, and one has to rely on newspapers, which I think are a really interesting public archive. Um, and, and, and I think they, they, they sort of go a long way towards illuminating and illustrating what's happening in the region. I'm going to move on to... My slides seem to be a little stuck, so I, I apologize for that. Uh, David Lunar, can you, uh, yeah, okay, there we go. Okay, super, I, I, I got this. Uh, okay, so this is, this is how this, this presentation is going to be broken down. Um, it, has, it has three parts, uh, and then uh, sort, of, I'll, I'll sort of just have some concluding comments at the end of it. I'm, I'm going to run through these reasonably quickly. This is, uh, uh, this, is, this is not meant to be a, a, a very detailed historical narrative, but instead uh, what I want to do is give, give time snapshots, if you may. Uh, one time snapshot, uh, which would pertain to, uh, to, to the late 19th, early 20th century, uh, which is what I'm calling colonial frontiers, indigenous flows. Uh, there's another time snapshot uh, but around about the middle of the 20th century, where I'm going to be talking about uh, primarily about the closure of the border between a, a sort of newly independent Pakistan and the People's Republic of China, which is followed in the 1960s and the 1970s with the construction of the Karakoram Highway. And then at the very end, I'll talk a little bit about uh, China's going out and what that actually means uh, for. Uh, China's going out and what that actually means for investments in the Karakoram region. And okay, um, the, the, some, some of the points that, I, some, some additional points that I wanted to foreground, uh, and, and I want to foreground this by way of seeing if there's something over here that we can, we can extrapolate beyond, beyond uh, the Karakoram Pamir. I mean, is there, is there, are there broader considerations that, uh, or are there broader thematics, if you may, uh, that might be relevant for thinking about infrastructure and connectivity? Um, one point that I wanted to make, and this is something that I've been, I've been interested in uh, for some time now, uh, is what connectivity looks like on the ground. Now, we're all familiar with BRI cartographies in which we have bold lines which move across Asia, into Africa, into Europe, across oceans. But what's actually happening on the ground? How does that connectivity actually look when you go to these particular locales where BRI is actually passing through? So that's, that's, that's one question which I think is, is, is interesting and relevant and it's sort of one really fruitful area of inquiry in the Karakoram. Um, another, another aspect of connectivity which I find um, interesting is that one usually finds that there's multiple connectivities uh, and sometimes they overlap, sometimes one subsumes or they subsume into one another. But in this presentation, for example, I'll be talking about, or I'll be describing very briefly, uh, pathways, caravan routes, uh, aviation, border passes, uh, postal and information services, roads, waterways, and now economic corridors as well. So, so the point is that when we think about connectivity, uh, I think 
there's, there's utility in thinking about a multitude of such connectivities, especially over time. Um, another thematic that, that seems to come out of uh, what I'm describing over here is that connectivity doesn't have to be a state project. And indeed, uh, in the late 19th century and through up until about the middle of the 20th century, uh, we find that there are local connectivities, but increasingly what we see is that the state attempts to control mobility, the state attempts to shape those, those uh, mobilities across spaces, across borders. And as a consequence of that, we find that there is a friction between local agency and, 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 and state control. And finally, I, I think one, one thing that we can take from this story, and this has applicability uh, beyond the Karakoram region, is that situating oneself at the edge of the state uh, really allows for uh, new imaginaries, new imaginaries of the nation, of the region, uh, indeed uh, of, of the world order if one takes BRI uh, as, uh, as, as, as a frame. So this is uh, going to be the first part of the presentation uh, up until about 1949. Um, the, 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 the map on the, on the right is uh, giving you a, a slightly better sense of uh, the places that I'll be talking about. And, and what's interesting about this map is that it's a map uh, which takes a snapshot in time around about 1935. Uh, and it, it, it shows you the proximity between regions in the Karakoram, the Soviet Union, uh, the People's Republic of China. But in any case, um, in the late 19th century, as we all know, there's geopolitical competition uh, between uh, the, the, the British in India uh, and the Soviet Union. And as a consequence of this, uh, the Karakoram region uh, is, 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 is now of uh, interest to, to the British. Uh, previously, the British had awarded the Karakoram region to the Maharaja of Jammu and Kashmir. Uh, but what we now found, what we now find at the end of the 19th century is that uh, because of the growing strategic importance of the region, in 1877, the British stationed an officer on special duty uh, in Gilgit. Uh, and the uh, task of this officer on special duty is to, is to just keep an eye on the frontier region and, 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 and to ascertain what exactly is happening. In, in the Karakurams. Uh, in 1889, the Gilgit Agency uh, is established. Uh, agency would, would mean that there's indirect colonial rule uh, over, over Gilgit. And in 1891, uh, Hunza and Nagar are brought into the Gilgit Agency as well. And, and just very, very quickly, if you, if you look at this map and if you look at the center of the map, uh, you'll see a place called Baltip, uh, and Baltip is the center of power. Earlier on, I had a slide in which uh, there was uh, an image of snowy mountains and a fort. So that was that was Baltip, and that's that's been traditionally the center of power. And and just if I can also very quickly point out one other aspect of this map, which is which is important. If if you can if you can see Baltip, which is kind of right at the center of the map, and if you follow it straight up. Uh, it's going to a village called Misgar. Uh, and then from Misgar, there's two passes which lead into, into China. One is marked MP and the other is marked KP. MP would be Mintaka Pass and KP would be Kilik Pass. And in, 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 just a, in just a moment, I'll talk more about these passes. But, but here, what I'm pointing out is that there's a route which is, which is going north from, um, from, from Gilgit into Baltit and then from there to China. Um, the, the, the court, Hunza had a court, so, so there, were, there were local rulers uh, that were, that were uh, more or less autonomous, but after 1891, after the region is incorporated into, into, into the Gilgit Agency, uh, foreign policy is being dictated by the British. So, so the Hunza court had traditionally uh, paid tribute to the Qing, uh, and uh, sort of on, on, the, on, the, on the left, I have an image of, of the autobiography of, of the last, uh, the second last Mir of Hunza. And, and he, he, he sort of describes how, how uh, they were instructed, they were ordered by the British to, to break off tribute relations 
uh, with the with the Qing court. Um, but having said that, sort of reading through his autobiography, one one also realizes that despite the fact that foreign policy is being controlled by colonial authorities and they're really keeping an eye on on the nobility, uh, as far as the local people are concerned, they still enjoy cross-border mobility. So, so pastoralists continue to move across the Karakoram Pamir uh, watershed. Uh, there's, there's a really interesting section in there in which he describes how the elite, the people who were, who were well-to-do, would travel to Kashgar to purchase wedding finery. So at times of celebration, it was understood that the finest goods were coming from Kashgar. Uh, there's finished goods which are still moving back and forth across the border. Uh, and and I'll, I'll pull up an example of that in just in just a moment. Uh, and finally, and this is this is something that that um, perhaps might be slightly harder for me to to to, to articulate. But Kashgar and the surrounding regions were were within the zone of mobility for the local elite. And what's interesting is that speaking with people over there, that's that's still the case. Uh, they they still talk about cross border connections from. Uh, the early 20th century and, and, and the way in which memory um, continues uh, to play a very powerful role in which people think about themselves and their connection to, 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 to the Karakoram, a wider Karakoram Pami region is, is interesting. And it's not just connections with, with Kashgar, but it's connections uh, northward to Central Asia as well. Now, for, for, for the British um, having control of uh, Hunza and Nagar was advantageous for one very specific reason, uh, and that is that they now had a new route to, to Kashgar. So, so the, the map on the left is, um, it's, it's, it's from, it's from uh, uh, the British Foreign Office archives, and, and, and uh, what it does is that it, I think, demonstrates quite nicely the two routes that were going into into, into, into Xinjiang towards, towards Kashgar. Uh, the route on the right was the old route. Uh, and this was the, the Sirinagar Leh route, uh, which crossed uh, into Yarkand and then from Yarkand that went up to Kashgar. But now, sort of as you can, as you can make out on the map, uh, there's a more direct route, uh, which, is, which is going to Kashgar. And you know, as, I, as I point out on the right, you know, it basically follows the, the Hunza River. Uh, and uh, it passes through local villages like Atabad, Bulmet, Khaibar, and then it reaches Mizgar. So, so Gilgit to Mizgar was 10 to 12 days. Mizgar is, is, um, Mizgar is the final settlement in British India at this point in time. There's no other year-round settlement which is north of Mizgar. And then from Mizgar, one had a choice of passes. One could either go over Kilik Pass or Mintika Pass, and once again in the, in the archive. Uh, there's, there's pros and cons of both passes, which one is steeper, which one is less snow in the winter, uh, which one has a, has a sharper descent. And once one was at the watershed, once one was on these passes, then one descended into the uh, Dang, uh, which is which is today in uh, Tashkurgan County in uh, Xinjiang. And just okay. Uh, this is uh, this is this is this is what Misgur looks like. Uh, this is what Misgur looks like uh, recently. This this image I took in 2016. Um, the, the, there's uh, sort of as as the region is brought under under British control. Uh, there's the establishment of postal services, and uh, the postal services begin in 1909. Uh, and in 1918, there's there's the construction of the post office, which is what the 1918 date in the title comes from. It's a it's admittedly a somewhat arbitrary date, uh, but but I thought I would use that as the starting point in the uh, in the title of the talk. Uh, in 1933, uh, there's uh, the establishment of the KD Fort, uh, just a short distance out of Bisgar. Uh, we weren't allowed to go there. We sort of restricted uh, from going there because it's too close to the border. Uh, but uh, KD Fort, when it was constructed in 1933, uh, becomes the northernmost outpost in British India. 
And the mail service was between British India and the consulate in Kashgar, which was maintained by the government of India. Um, this is, so this goes back to the point that I was, I was, I was making uh, just a few minutes ago. Uh, this, is also, this is also part of the colonial archive. Uh, and, and this is illustrative of the type of local mobility. So, so this, is, this is a document that comes to us um, uh, uh, sort of vis-a-vis -vis, um, uh, vis -vis, uh, sort of accounts of what's being uh, or documentation of what's what's passing through through the border, and and you know as you can see over here there's uh, so so the, the first of these pages these are exports from Chinese Turkestan to India via Gilgit so this is over the Mintaka route 1932 1933 so ponies donkeys cotton uh, silk carpets. Uh, these are all moving from Xinjiang uh, into, into British India. Um, and, and then sort of the, the remarks on the, on the right-hand side are, are actually also quite, quite interesting as well. So, so, you know, they're talking about the pilgrimage routes, routes they're talking about, uh, the, they're, they're sort of documenting how there's an increase in cost uh, as a result of uh, the people going for, for, for pilgrimage. And then we also have, uh, documentation of goods that are moving in the other direction that are coming in uh, from British India into, into Xinjiang. Uh, and, and, and sort of here, uh, there's medicines, batteries, dyes, spices. Um, uh, the, 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 the tea trade uh, is interestingly uh, an, uh, one which is, which is happening in both directions. There's now Lipton tea uh, going from British India uh, towards Kashgar. Um, so, so the, the, the point is that despite the fact that there is increasing state control, cross-border mobilities uh, are continuing. Mm. Okay, um, this is now the second part uh, of, of the talk, uh, sort of the, the, other, the other snapshots, uh, if you may. Uh, 1947, Pakistan and India become independent. Uh, Gilgit and uh, the region that's uh, Gilgit Agency and the region that's next to the Gilgit Agency, which is which is known as Baltistan, uh, these initially go to India, but they join Pakistan through local secession. This is it's a it's a longer story. It's a it's a it's a much longer story. But the the, the key point over here is that this is this is the beginnings of uh, the Kashmir dispute. Uh, historically, uh, Gilgit and Baltistan were part of Greater Kashmir. Uh, and after 1948, about one third of that Greater Kashmir is with Pakistan, two thirds of that is with India, and both sides dispute the claims of, of, of the others. But crucially, uh, and, and this is where the infrastructure angle I think becomes very pronounced, uh, crucially what we find is that uh, Pakistan doesn't have a year round land linked to Gilgit and Baltistan. There's a there's a high altitude mule track, which is crossable only in the summer. And as a consequence of that, uh, sort of the, the, the air route or flights in and out of the Karakurams uh, end up becoming uh, the only viable way of connecting the Karakuram region to, to Pakistan. And I've put viable in scare quotes because the flight in was uh, extremely, extremely uh, uh, tenuous. Um, sort of, Aviation had, uh, even under colonial times, there, there had been colonial aviation in the Karakoram regions. This is a flight map that I found in the India Office Library Archives. Um, and, and, and these, and, and, and the colonial officials had built rudimentary airfields in the Karakorams. And that was what was being used now in the post-colonial state. And, and, and on the, on, and then it was, it was by all accounts. And then there's actually many accounts of aviation uh, uh, sort of pertaining to uh, many accounts of uh, many accounts pertaining to flying into the Karakoram region in the 1950s and the 1960s, and they all they all talk about uh, sort of how how um, how how scary the flight was, uh, how how difficult the route was by virtue of the fact that one is flying in between uh, some some um, extremely extremely high mountains, um, and 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 these are. These are these are just uh, some images that I found from in a flight magazine, 1951. Just just giving one a sense of uh, what on on the left, what the landing looked like coming into Skardu, which was another of the large towns 
Uh, and on the right, uh, you have um, an Orient Airways. Orient Airways was the precursor to uh, Pakistan International Airways. And, and, and these were uh, DC-3 Dakotas, which were decommissioned from the US Air Force, which were then used to fly in and out of the Karakoram region. So as far as Pakistan is concerned, connectivity with Gilgit is, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a major challenge. And, and initially, at least, they're rely, as, as they're widening that donkey path and making it possible by Jeep, they're relying on aviation to go in and out of, in and out of the region. Um, the other thing that happens is that uh, in 1949, 1950, when the Chinese Communist Party fans out into Xinjiang and, and, and takes control of, of, of Xinjiang, they close off the border crossings into northern Pakistan. And um, here we have a story from uh, 1950, June 1950. It was published in, in, in the, the Washington Post, in which they're describing how uh, the traders that used to come in from, from, from Kashgar uh, are no longer coming in. Uh, and and, and that, that trade, which had, had continued pretty much unabated, uh, is, is, uh, is no longer, uh, that, that trade route has been, has been shut. So for the sake of time, I'll just sort of uh, 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 quickly sort of move on to the next slide. Um, there's sort of, so, so there's the trade route that's, that's, uh, that's been shut off. And then there's also uh, refugees which are, which are moving uh, across the border as well, or trying to get across the border. And in many instances, these are, these are, these are ex uh, Guamindan soldiers. Uh, who are who are fleeing into into Pakistan and, and sort of this this story from from the same year as well uh, describes how uh, there was there was uh, people who were who were trying to take refuge uh, in, in 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 Pakistan. But sort of the, the bit that I wanted to point out is that this uh, sort of story too talks about uh, the 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 Hajj route from 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 Xinjiang uh, into the Karakoram. Uh, and then it sort of mentions that um, nearly 90% of Xinjiang's population is Muslim and the traditional. Indeed, the only practical route for Hajj pilgrims is south through Gilgit and on to Karachi. So once again, I think what's interesting over here is the way in which uh, we see this region being connected to an Indian Ocean uh, mobility circuit as well. And then when this year's Hajj season finishes, Gilgit will see thousands of unknown turkeys trekking north towards an unpredictable reception. And in this wasteland, it is hard to keep track of people and determine whether they are genuine or not. So, so that, that gaze of the state on the border, if you may, is, is, is being articulated here uh, in, a, in a fairly pronounced way. Um, once again, running through, running through this fairly quickly, um, 1969, there's the resumption of official, there's the resumption of trade between China and Pakistan. Uh, but it's it's official trade, uh, and it's very closely regulated by uh, governments and uh, trade cartels on, on on both sides of the border. And they use mintaka parks uh, in 1969. Uh, and um, in 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 um, in August 1969, uh, there's 50 camels and 14 uh, horsemen who who cross into Pakistan, uh, and then uh, sort of caravan trade, if you may. Uh, continues for about three years, uh, and after three years, uh, there's a there's a, a, a sort of a, a road which becomes possible. So, so in the meantime, uh, road construction had been had been taking place as well. Just, uh, excuse me while I nudge this forward. Uh, excuse me, it seems to be stuck. I'll, I'll, I'll just get it moving again, hopefully. So, okay. Uh, oh, oops, sorry. It's moving. Okay. Yeah. So, so this is this is the other. Um, 
This is the other story that's happening in the backdrop, that, which is the construction of a road between, um, between uh, connecting the Pakistan road network to the Chinese road network. Uh, I describe this as, as a Bandong moment because it's, it's a road which is, it's, it's a construction project, which is really, it's, it's scripted in the Bandung uh, lexicon. Um, again, this is, it's a, it's a, it's a longer story. Uh, and uh, what, what, what I should perhaps underscore over here is the fact that uh, for both Pakistan and for China, uh, there is uh, shared geopolitical interests uh, insofar as um, hostility with India is concerned. So, so that's, I think, one of the, the, the key points to, to take away from this, uh, that uh, for both these countries, rivalry with India uh, is something that ends up bringing them, them closer together. And interestingly, uh, between the mid 1960s and the mid 1980s, uh, China ends up adopting Pakistan's position on, on Kashmir. Uh, and I apologize, it's. Uh, so I'll, I'll just sort of move through the through the rest of the slides uh, fairly quickly because I, I, I realize that sort of uh, we're, we're getting close to the end of the uh, allotted time. Uh, but but now we see the the, uh, the construction of the Karakoram Highway, uh, which on the map on the left uh, you can see as sort of connecting Islamabad, which is sort of right on the lower left hand side of the map. Uh, and it's, 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 it's going straight north, and it, as you can see, uh, it terminates in uh, Kashgar. Um, just sort of, okay, so this is, this is the final part of, uh, of this presentation. Uh, and, and sort of now, this snapshot, if you may, is, is, is focused on the beginning of the 21st century. And, and the beginning of the 21st century is uh, China's the, the so-called going out of China when Chinese SOEs and, and, and private businesses are being encouraged to uh, invest overseas. I actually find, I, I find that the, the, the decade before BRI very interesting because it's in that decade prior to BRI that one starts getting a sense of sort of how we got to BRI as an international financing mechanism. And, I just want to mention two examples from, from the Karakoram. Uh, one was in um, 2000 and one dates to 2002, when uh, Sinotrans Xinjiang, and Sinotrans, as, as I'm sure everyone knows, is the largest logistics provider in China. Uh, it partners, and, and Sinotrans Xinjiang is then the local subsidiary of Sinotrans. But Sinotans Xinjiang partners with the local Hunza Trust and they, they build and operate a dry port in North Pakistan. And, and the image on the right uh, is of the Sust dry port. And I took this photograph in 2012. So, so a year before the China-Pakistan economic corridor was announced. And then in 2008, there's another example of uh, Chinese capital being invested in the Karakoram region when the China Road and Bridge Building Corporation along with uh, the National Highway Association, uh, financed by the Export Import Bank of China, is upgrading the Karakoram Highway. Um, in, in, in 2013, uh, BRI it sort of comes to Pakistan in the form of the China-Pakistan uh, Economic Corridor. And the reason why, the reason why this is important for, for, for uh, the story that I'm uh, sort of narrating over here is that the Karakoram Pamir watershed now becomes the gateway for Chinese investments in Pakistan. And up until the present, about $60 billion have been, have been uh, uh, pledged uh, in terms of investment in infrastructure. And 
and and sort of as you can as you can see over here uh, that the lines on the map uh, similar to these global BRI projections are sort of envisioned as 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 compressing space and easing passage across across time. Um, but but I I I wonder about that and I question that that imaginary. Uh, both of these. Um, this is a border market in North Pakistan that I've visited about, I've visited this about uh, five or six times in the last decade and, and, and then over the last 30 years I've probably been here 10 to 12 times. Uh, when, you're, um, when you're crossing from China into Pakistan, this is, this is, the, first, um, this is the first market, it's known as Afiyatabad, sometimes described as Sost Bazar as well. And these are uh, the, these images were taken at, on, on, on different trips, but they, they, I think they, they, they illustrate sort of two views of, of BRI and what BRI looks like on the ground. On the image on the right, this is perhaps what is more typical of what we might imagine as BRI presenting as. Uh, these, are, these are container trucks that are actually returning empty. There's a dry port sort of up on the high ridge. Uh, these container trucks are now going back to China. And, and sort of if standing here on that particular day, there was dozens of these trucks which were, which were returning to, to, to China. But if you look at the image on the left, uh, and if you look closely, then, then you realize that this is, you know, it's a very small market. And, and the other interesting thing about this market is that most of the shops are, are empty. And in fact, they're not just empty, but they were never, they were never actually occupied. So, as a result of BRI, there's been a lot of speculation. People have built shops, people have built a commercial area, but no one is actually occupying this infrastructure. No one is actually utilizing it. And in fact, what the shopkeepers um, have, have told me repeatedly is that since BRI, uh, trade has actually, their trade, their businesses have actually declined because there's less of, the cross-border peddling that used to happen, and more of capital and heavy cargo moving across the border. So the point is that uh, the, 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 the grand imaginaries, uh, cargo moving, capital moving, that's certainly the case. But those, those local mobilities, evidence of which we find in the colonial archive, for example, or what traders might recall from five years ago, 10 years ago, uh, there's been a decline in that. This is, um, this, is, this is another view, and I'm just sort of nearing the very end of this presentation now, but this is, this is another view of, uh, of, of, of what, what BRI represents as. Uh, these, are, these are construction sites uh, along uh, the, the upper Indus uh, cascade. Um, there's there's a, 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 the, 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 the Amir Basha Dam, uh, which, is, which is being constructed over here. Uh, it's a joint project between China power and a paramilitary arm of the Pakistan military. And for, for long stretches of the road, one now passes along construction sites and they're, they're heavily securitized places. So if you, if you look carefully on the image on the left, you'll see that there's razor wire uh, on top of um, on top of the wall, and then every so often one will come across uh, uh, sentries. One will come across uh, um, sort of a, a military patrol, uh, heli pads painted in the middle of the highway. So, on on the one hand, there's there's securing capital, and you know, sort of here I'm using securing as a means of attracting investment, but there's, there's another securing happening as well, uh, whereby uh, there's new security infrastructure. Uh, the image on the right uh, is uh, sort of a heavy vehicle working on the dam construction site. And, 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 and just want to point out something very interesting about this image, which is the fact that, it, that, that the truck doesn't have a license plate. Uh, and, and, and the first time, we, we passed by one of these, you know, it seemed a little odd and we thought, okay, well, you know, maybe that's an anomaly, but none of the heavy vehicles working on these construction sites uh, have, have, have license plates. So, so, you know, it's almost as if it's a, it's a, it's a zone of exception, if you may add, uh, where, where a non-normative order ends up becoming, becoming the norm. So 
just to just to sort of conclude this 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 long walk through history uh, and ask uh, what exactly we can draw from all of this. Well, the first thing that I wanted to 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 point out or underscore is the fact that there's 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 multiple connectivity infrastructures. Uh, it's sort of in this in this short talk we saw the the, the importance of pathways, uh, aviation boat or water travel i didn't talk very much about that but but you know it's 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 certainly there highways economic corridors so this is all this is this is really what a, what a century of connectivity infrastructure uh might might look like um i also find it uh, interesting that state cartographies look very different when one moves to the ground level and and what's very often depicted as lines on the map really present as present very differently uh, from, from a ground level perspective. The other issue, uh, which I think is worth foregrounding is the fact that uh, connectivity is a pivotal issue for the state. Uh, and uh, that's certainly something that I can say for, for Pakistan, where, where there's almost uh, a hubris of connectivity. And, and I was actually um, just a few days ago, uh, looking through remarks that President Xi Jinping had made in Davos in 2017, where once again, you know, he talked about the importance of building a connective, uh, connected world. Um, I think the other, the other interesting angle in this is that connectivity need not be a state project. I think pathways, border crossings, uh, especially in the early 20th century are evidence of that, but the state will act upon it. So. Um, there can be pre-existing connectivities, but it's going to be something that the state will, will, will try and try and control. And as a consequence of that, one of the things that one then finds is that there's sometimes uh, friction between what we can describe as local agency and state control. Uh, there's, there's new national imaginaries, which, which are um, not just important, but, but that imagination is taking place at the border, uh, that imagination takes place when one sort of uh, when one takes the border and really sort of brings it to the center of uh, how one wants to one wants to imagine the nation, the region, uh, a new global order, if you may. And an important part of that national imagination or regional imagination or global imagination is the ways in which one might end up restrict controlling, shaping, redefining connectivity infrastructure. So in that sense, the role of infrastructure is, 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 is really key and critical. And uh, consequently, the last point is that uh, places which, which might have been insignificant as far as the long durée of modern history is concerned, have all of a sudden in the 21st century become really pivotal places from where to stand and Ponder the 21st century world. So thank you very much. I sort of, uh, uh, sort of, I appreciate comments, uh, criticism, feedback, uh, anything of the sort. So I'll just end my slide sharing. Okay. Super. Thank you. Uh, thank Dr. Hassan Kara to present his fascinating research. Now, uh, let's move on to the next section, comment and questions. I say, David, you are the first. Uh, okay. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Yeah. Okay, great. Okay, thank you. That was really fascinating. Uh, and um, uh, so I had, um, yeah, uh, Actually, first of all, I just had one uh, very specific co like question of information, and then um, I, I just wanted to comment on the notion of filtered connectivity or ask about it. But about the um, so there was that um, news article that mentioned that thousands of pilgrims coming back from the Hajj were, I guess, going to be blocked at the Chinese border, which had just been closed by the new um, communist regime. So. I was just surprised to the, at the number of thousands. So it sounds like this was actually a major uh, pilgrimage route that was highly, um, you know, that means there's 
you need a lot of um, um, accommodations and food stalls and all this uh, infrastructure all along the way to um, uh, to allow this. Uh, so it just gives me an idea of the scale of the uh, importance of this route. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, so I just wanted to check with you, do you. Is that true that there were really so many pilgrims? I, yeah, the David. I mean, that's 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 a that's a really that's a really good question. I think thousands might be slightly hyperbolic, but uh -huh. uh, it 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 would be a fairly large number. Um, right. In in two thousand and three, I took a bus from Kashgar down to Sost, and I was on a bus which was filled with hajis, uh -huh. uh, and 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 it was it was a fascinating experience. And uh, and and but the question of infrastructure is a valid one because. Uh, they, they, they all got off at a particular hotel in Gilgit, uh, uh -huh. and that's where they would all stay. Uh, yeah. So, so and, and, and it was run by, by Kashkaris. And then um, once they went from Gilgit to Rawalpindi, they would have stayed in one of two different hostels. Uh, and Alessandro Ripo has written about this. Mm -hmm. uh, I think one was called uh, Khotan House, and then there was a second one as well. So, yeah, I mean, this this infrastructure certainly exists, and it existed into the 21st century. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I don't think it's functional anymore. I don't think that's that's a that's a viable right. route anymore. But it certainly was uh, in the first decade of the 21st century. Ah, interesting. So, and I guess the other. So, I was really fascinated by what your. Um, I mean, basically the main um, the main kind of uh, thrust of your narrative, which is um, because it's comparable to um, what I and my uh, colleague Josiba Estevez have been looking at in the China Laos border region, China mm -hmm. Vietnam Laos, and what we found was that um, looking into the history uh, in the late nineteenth century is that. And when you look at various historical accounts and explore and travelers and explorers reports, and you find that at that time, the level of uh, interconnectivity of uh, caravans going back and forth of you could even find in the most remote villages markets, these German produce uh, and mm. things like that. Um, and then then you have um, in the, I guess, Cold War period, all these hard borders being established. And so then the regions become much more remote, actually. So they weren't remote before. And then they become remote because of all the hard borders. And then now when the borders reopen, and now all these, uh, and what we're seeing is a lot of the new uh, roads and um, are actually following the older um, uh, caravan routes uh, and things like that. So in a sense, but you brought this really interesting idea of, uh, filtered connectivity. So I think you were mentioning in terms of Karakram mm -hmm. Highway. And so I was really, that's a really interesting idea. And I was wondering if um, um, we might even think of different ways of filtering because, so in the, um, obviously in a place, like whether we're talking about Laos or a Karakram region uh, in the 19th or pre-colonial era and even into the colonial era, there are these all these small kingdoms and small um, uh, polities in these regions, um, and so there's no hard border. But actually, these little kingdoms are kind of filters, right? Because they extract um, uh, um, payments uh, for mm -hmm. caravans passing through, or they they kind of exercise some some kind of control. So it's not a border, it's like an entity which is filtering in a, a polity. Uh, mm -hmm. But now you have a border and the state wants people to flow in and out to promote trade, but it also wants to control who's coming in and out. Um, I'm just curious if, right, like how you would think more about this idea of a filtered uh, connectivity. So I would say that there's, um... There's different reasons why filtering is happening across the Karakuram Pamir watershed. Uh -huh. uh, one is, um, one is, one is, um, okay. So, so uh, the, the the highway is described as a friendship highway. It's a friendship border. Uh, so, so it's 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 ostensibly non-militarized, but it is it is a securitized space. Uh, and uh, I've, I've, I've sort of working on a paper right now in which I'm talking about securitization in Gilgit-Baltistan and the role of checkpoints along the Karakoram Highway. So, so there's, 
there's continuous checks on identity, uh, on, on, on local mobilities. And, um, and, and, and some of that uh, is, is uh, I think, a result of geopolitical anxiety on the part of Pakistan, sort of insofar as it needs to be extremely sensitive to China's security concerns. Uh, so, so sort of it, it is it is a watched space, and security infrastructure is is sort of determining uh, who is coming in and 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 who is going out. And 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 I've I've crossed twice from um, Kashgar into into uh, Sust into North Pakistan, and in two thousand and three and two thousand and five, and both times I was. I was astonished at the level of security uh, coming in from China into, into Pakistan. So, so there, is, there is sort of the hard securitization that's, that's acting as a filter, uh, if you may. Um, sort of other examples of that uh, would be policy decisions on the part of the state. So for example, uh, Pakistanis can't get tourist visas for China. So, so it's, not, uh, it's not an infrastructure that that, that, that can be used for leisure travel. Uh, yet another way of filtering would be by imposing tariff regimes, which no longer make it viable for small traders to self-import goods from Xinjiang into Pakistan. So this used to happen um, so until about 2012, 2011, uh, that, that you'd have you'd have three to 4,000 small traders applying for border trading permits, which would allow them to cross from Pakistan, go as far as Kashgar, buy goods, and then self-import them. But after BRI, there's new tariff regimes which are, which are being imposed. And it's no longer viable for these, for these people to go across the border. And, and the, the number of people who apply for these border trading permits has fallen dramatically. So it's gone from something like 3,500, uh, I think 3,500 might have been 2013, 2014 to, to less than 1,000 now, because it's just no longer viable. Uh, and instead, what we find is that there's more cargo coming in. So, so, so facilitation of a certain type of connectivity, a certain type of mobility, but filtering out the small trader because ultimately, you know, who cares about the small trader? I mean, not not. I mean, the small trader doesn't really fit into these into these um, imaginaries of twenty first century global connectivity. Thank you, thank you, Doctor Hassan and uh, Doctor Chen. You can ask your question. Oh, thank you. Uh, can you hear me loud and clear? Yes, I can. Okay, yes. good. Thank you, thank you, Professor Hassan, for your wonderful presentation. And I used to work in uh, Tashkagan, actually. Uh, in 2000, 2005, 2010, before the BRI, then after the Karakulam highways, and focusing on religion and the Tajis at that time. And so I, I totally echo what you have mentioned. Uh, there are a couple, a few questions that are always puzzling the mind, and maybe you can enlighten me. Like in Kashgargan, it is actually the Kashgargan uh, Tajis Autonomous County that covers the whole region bordering China and Pakistan. I find it very puzzling that uh, most of the traders or the cross borders are the Chinese. Uh, from the China side, then the Tajis, first of all. Mm -hmm. And secondly, uh, the Tajis over there are, I think it's Shiites instead mm -hmm. of Sunnis. Uh, because I checked a few times, they are Shiites, they are not Sunnis. So they cannot readily relate to the Pakistan's uh, Muslim community, which are mostly uh, uh, Sunnis. And also, I was a bit puzzling at that time when I worked with Tajis, they, most of them began to study Dari uh, of Fasis than instead of Udu. So mm -hmm. it seems that they have a much closer connectivity with uh, the Tajis and also Heinz and uh, also by reference with uh, Iran than mm -hmm. with Pakistan. So I, I was uh, uh, a bit on, on, on the puzzling on the identity of the nationality, ethnicities, mm -hmm. to what effect, uh, to what does it affect the trading between China and Pakistan? Because mm -hmm. supposedly the Tajis will be there, but yet they are not uh, uh, Sunnis and they don't speak Urdu. Instead, the Chinese were doing it and they are, uh, the, the Tajis are more tied with the Iran's uh, food, the Tajikistan, uh, than uh, 
Uh, they are very neighborhood, but then through the 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 uh, the the, uh, the the current criminal highways to Pakistan. So, may uh, what will be the role of the ethnicities and even religion played in this mm -hmm. dynamic in terms of the open, basically, uh, free, uh, like high mobility mobility regions? So that's always I, I'm I'm puzzling to role uh, do they play? It. And secondly, just a brief comment to about the uh, Hajis that you seen. Mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. Fighting through the uh, Pakistan, the one of the main reasons at that time was that there wasn't any controlled act of the making the Hajis to Mecca. Yet they did some entrepreneurs, uh, the, the actually the, the Uyghurs. I I know a few of those who actually organized those uh, mm -hmm. uh, well, trips. They find out that the uh, the the, uh, the 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 em uh, embassy in the uh, in the uh, in Karachi uh, of the, 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 the Saudi Arabian government, they could issue Mecca, uh, Mecca visa once mm -hmm. you arrive there. And yeah. otherwise, uh, if you want to apply food in Beijing, there's a limited quota by the Islamic Association, okay. which is right. basically the, the Uyghurs could not get it. They only got the three right. quotas. So instead they went through the other route, but yeah. it made a big mess, not in Pakistan, but in at the end, Saudi Arabia. Okay. 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 Uh, yeah, somehow, yeah. some people talk with Beijing and they stop this fraud. And I, right. I, 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 I heard part of it when I was working in Xinjiang and how they got through with the whole system and that, how they charge the whole thing and who gets how many percentage of cut, including the embassy right. stuff in Saudi, uh, uh, of Saudi Arabia in Pakistan. Right. They got about forty percent only. Sure. Something sure. like that. Yeah. But no, anyway, it was a trade. It was a trade. It was a business oriented uh, uh, sure. <laughs> enterprise. Anyways, it was just a sideline because I seen those organized before and uh, they stopped already. But anyways, yeah, back to the the the, the role of the ethnicities, the religions, and the uh, type that shapes the how 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 do you comment on that? That was a bit puzzled on that part as well. From even up to now, when I think about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, thank you, Doctor Chan. I mean, that's thank you, thank you for that question. Um, so the the. The, the the people on the Pakistan side of the border uh, would describe themselves as Bakhi, uh, and Bakhi would be similar to uh, the Tajiks. Uh, so oh. they're speakers. Okay, they're so, the so, Tajik speakings. Yeah, they're, okay. they're, they're, so so they're Bakhi speakers, uh, and yes, I mean you're absolutely correct. Uh, they're 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 Shia, uh, and and they're followers of the Aga Khan. Uh, Aga, so so yeah. they're, they're 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 Ismaili they're Ismaili Shia, and and I I have um, I have long-term acquaintances in North Pakistan in a, in a region called Shumshal. And, mm -hmm. and it's interesting because they then describe the people in Tashkargan as our family, that, you know, well, you know, oh, okay. that's our family over there. And, and, and you know, I, and, and I said, okay, well, that's, that's really interesting. I mean, have you, have you, have you been to Tashkargan? I mean, do you, do you know any family members? And, and they yeah. don't, so they can't name anyone. They can't name a relative. But by virtue of the fact that there is there is a, a sort of a common uh, um, not just a common religion but but a common language as well, okay. uh, they'll say that well well they're members of our family. Yeah. What's what's also interesting, if I can add to that, is that uh, there is this. Uh, I mean, there's 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 a sense of proximity with the Tajiks, but there isn't, and I'm saying this hesitantly because um, I'm not entirely certain about this, but. Speaking to people in North Pakistan, I don't get the sense that there is a similar sense of uh, proximity with the Uyghurs. Uh, so, so by oh, with the Uyghurs, it's, okay, it's yeah, yeah, Uyghurs. yeah, right. So, so, right. So, yeah, right. No, whereas whereas the Bakhi will speak about the Tajiks and Tushkargan, for example, with a great deal of affinity, even though you know they they, they don't know anyone there, they, they might not even be part of this cross border trade. Mm -hmm. uh, but but they don't speak about the. Uh, the, the, the Uyghurs uh, or the Kazakhs mm -hmm. for that matter, yeah. with, uh, with yeah. the same degree of, of affinity. And, and, and my, my own sense is that religion is important, but, but language plays a very important mm -hmm. role. Well. One, one term that I've heard them use is uh, Hamzaban. So Hamzaban yes. means uh, sharing a language. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and language, uh, and, and one, one sees sort of those sort of connections. And, and the Karakoram region, by the way, it's a, it's a, it's a multi-ethnic, multi-religious region. Uh, but but one sees proximity is being built uh, through through or proximity is being found through language. Mm. Uh, you know, people discover they speak the same language or or they're the same. They have the same mother tongue, and then all of a sudden, you know, there's a, a yeah. connection is being a connection yeah. is being forged. 
Yeah. So can you say that the, uh, for example, the Tajis in uh, uh, the Tashkagant becomes the bridge with this uh, uh, trading with uh, BRI uh, like in Pakistan because you have counterparts on the other side of the border instead of the Uyghurs, which they don't have counterparts on the, in Pakistan that much. Or no, the Han, Han Chinese can replace that particular bridge for it historical could, reasons. It could be, it could be. Um, mm. Certainly, I think that that potential does exist. Uh, mm. And it's, I mean, the, and, and, and certainly I think another another bridging community would have been Pakistani traders uh, oh, yeah. who've gone and set up businesses in Tashkurgan. Oh, yeah. And I haven't been to Tashkurgan now in a long time, but mm. and once again, you know, this information comes to me through through my colleague Alessandro Ripa, who who's been there more recently. But but he describes how in Tashkurgan you had you had a number of Pakistanis which had yeah. opened opened shops as well. So so, but again, you know, what what the what what the present status is, um, I'm not certain about. Also because of COVID nineteen and the fact that the border yes. is now being closed. Uh, so 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 what 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 these connectivities are going to look like perhaps in one or two years time when we return to normal is mm. is is is, yeah. is something that remains to be seen. Yeah, thank you. My pleasure. My pleasure. Who still have questions? Okay. If you don't have questions, so uh, how about we stop here? Okay. Uh, I have I have uh, another question actually. Then um, just one quick question. Um, so in follow up on the ethnicity question, um, so, okay, so you mentioned that the local cross border uh, kind of trade uh, is kind of decline, uh, but this big trucking, you know, so now in various countries, often it's one ethnic group dominates the trucking on certain routes. And even once I heard that in Pakistan, it was Afghanis who are the mm -hmm. truckers. So along this route, mm -hmm. who runs the truck, the trucking trade between Xinjiang and um, Pakistan? Uh, and which ethnic group on either side? So uh, my, my sense is that it's mostly cargo coming in from China and it would uh -huh. be Han Chinese uh, uh -huh. who, are, yeah, who are crossing the border. Uh, virtually, virtually nothing is going from Pakistan uh, oh. to the other side. I mean, it's it's uh -huh. it's it's really it's a it's a one way trade. Um, and, so it's and Han Chinese drivers. The drivers are Han Chinese. The drivers are Han Chinese, and uh -huh. and one sees this. I mean, standing um, standing sort of in Sust Bazar, and 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 one sees this because what happens is that the 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 trucks come down from the dry port. Uh, and then there's a there's a security check post where they have to stop. Uh, they get out, they show their papers, and then they they throw open the container truck just to show that it's empty, just to mm -hmm. sort of uh, uh, record that it's returning empty. Uh, and 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 the drivers are all the drivers are all Han Chinese. Yeah. Uh huh. And they drive all the way down into like the heartland of Pakistan, or no? They only go as far as they only go as far as Sus. So uh -huh, right. uh, and 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 from the border down to Sust used to be it used to be four hours from Punjab to Sust uh, the the border uh -huh. market that I that I showed but now with the upgrading of the Karakoram Highway I, I think see. it's under two hours uh, so they'll go to the dry port uh, they'll they'll uh, unload the cargo at the dry port one forty foot container gets split up into three of the Bedford trucks the type that you've probably seen in Pakistan so those trucks are still running. Mm -hmm. uh, and, mm -hmm. and and they're used especially in the Karakoram because uh, the, the 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 container truck, the forty foot container, uh, is is hard to navigate on the mountain roads. <laughs> With the upgrade of the highway, I think they're able to get them past sort of um, past the, the the narrow turns. But the, the the local truckers still prefer to use the, the old Bedfords. Mm -hmm. uh, and and yeah, I mean that's that's predominantly a Pashtun, uh, a Waziri. Uh, uh, a Waziri um, um, sort of uh, uh, how should I describe? But it's primarily Pashtun drivers, Waziri drivers who are who are uh -huh. uh, yeah sort of doing that local trucking, if you may. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Yeah. Well, thank you. And uh, Dr. Emily, you can ask. Yeah. 
Thank you so much. Um, if, what a fascinating presentation. I really like your idea about the, um, the filtered connectivity and also securing capital and the multiple kind of ways of looking at that. Um, and I'm really interested in this idea of the friendship border and you know the difference between a friendship border and a more militarized border zone. Um, but I am also feeling like there's a sad there's a sad story going on here, and it's a very very predictable story, and it's the story of you know capitalism um, and basically you know people with the the largest conglomerations and the biggest forms of capital being able to extend themselves and create markets for their products, and then the little guy being left out, right? And so you're so now especially with this last point that you have mentioned where you know Chinese trade is coming in, dumping product and leaving, and there isn't a reciprocal exchange or a two-way exchange, uh, it's really sad actually. And um, you know, the, of course the deal uh, along the, the BRI, along the whole BRI is we're gonna come in and invest millions and millions of dollars in building infrastructure. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's what that's the gift. That's our, that's that's part of the reciprocal part. We're going to invest in this infrastructure, but it's an investment to create markets and to create jobs for for Chinese citizens and well, who, who build highways and roads. And, you know, the place where I'm living, who build a, a hydro power station and uh, I'm living in Indonesia. And um, so the so I guess like what I want to ask is. Are there local people who see the way that these economic relationships are playing out and want to push back or want to create alternative routes or, you know, want to try to resume their small man trade? Yeah, no, that's 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 an excellent question. Uh, so so a lot of uh, so so for, for, for many people who used to who used to engage in cross border trade, this was something that contributed to a diversified household economy. So the household economy in North Pakistan was diversified in the sense that uh, there was usually a small piece of land on which one would grow subsistence crops. Uh, they might have livestock, which would be sold on local markets. There's a remittance economy because every household would have a family member working in the large cities, sending some money back uh, to, to the villages. And then there would be, in, in it, it varied from, from region to region, but there might be one or two family members who make occasional trips to Kashgar, uh, buy manufactured goods, uh, sell them on local markets, uh, and add cash to the household economy. Many of these people have now given up on that and they've looked for, for other venues. So for example, someone that I know from a valley called Chipurson, uh, once the tariff rates went up, he's now, um, he's now sort of partnering with some local villagers and, and uh, running a marriage hall in Rawalpindi. So, so he's given up on the China trade, uh, if you may. But I think one of the things that ends up happening is that um, it wasn't just trade which was, um, which was happening across the border, but there was also familial connections, there was people to people connections, and that's also, that's also disappearing. And as far as the first part of your question is concerned, is there, is there resistance to this model of connectivity? There is, uh, but... Um, but it's a, it's a, it's it's become a sensitive political issue in Pakistan because, uh, as far as the state is concerned, as far as state authorities are concerned, it's it's very important that uh, that that they maximize benefit through Chinese investments, and the state is very touchy about criticism of uh, BRI investments in Pakistan, and and these are. In terms of the infrastructure itself, uh, what one finds is that these are heavily securitized spaces, astonishingly so. I mean, I um, sort of on, on, on my last trip to the region, which was exactly 12 months ago, I was, I was taken aback at the extent of uh, military presence around the construction sites. And this is prior to the attack that happened uh, in July this year uh, at the dam construction site. Now, I understand that whenever there is a construction site going up, you know, you, you put a chain link fence, fence around it. That, that happens everywhere in the world. But, but the degree to which um, uh, the military and the paramilitary is, 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 is um, uh, involved uh, in uh, securing these sites uh, is, is really quite, quite astonishing. So to then raise questions or to then say that, well, what about cross-border mobilities? What about pollution? What about the fact that 
um, uh, where, where we're losing traditional land, we're losing access to the commons. It's a, it's a, one, one potentially pays a heavy price for, for asking those sort of questions, especially if uh, sort of one doesn't have connections, if, 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 if you know, one, one is relatively, relatively powerless as, as many of the local uh, mountain communities are. Uh, sorry, just a follow up, uh, just an information question sure. for follow up. Um, so f you mentioned that Pakistanis can't get tourist visas uh, mm -hmm. for China at all, or just you yeah. can't you no. OK, that's you that's can, no, no, you can, yeah, no, no, you can you can get a you can get a business visa. Uh, so you right. can get a business visa. Uh, the 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 local people can get these border trading permits, which allows them to go as far as Kashgar. But no, I mean Pakistanis can't get a tourist visa for for China. So if if you did want to try to go over that specific Karakoram Pass and and sell some product in China, uh, you could do it through a, a business visa, and you'd have to pay tariffs. Or would or would local traders simply take it to that market and hope that the product can get picked up by incoming Chinese and taken? Yes. So yeah, so the two ways of doing it. So so the, the people who travel to China, the Pakistanis who travel to China on a business visa probably won't be going up to Kashgar or Tashkarban. So they'll, you know, they'll go to Yibu, they'll go to Guangzhou, they'll go to Shanghai. Um, yeah. But the, the, the local people will, will get one of these border passes, which will allow them to travel as far as Kashgar. Uh, and 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 it's it's very restrictive uh, in the sense that in Kashgar, I think they can only stay at uh, uh, at Chinibar, which was the, um, the which was which was the former British consulate, which has been which has been turned into which well, long ago it was turned into a hotel. But there's 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 only officially at least there's only one place that they can stay. Uh, so so it's it's not the same as traveling to China on a regular business visa, where mobility wouldn't be restricted. I mean, this is this is really um, it's for a very specific purpose, uh, which is shuttling goods across the border. It's a border trading permit. And, 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 and I believe China did something similar with, uh, with the Central Asian Republics as well. Uh, and it falls under a separate category. It's, it's, it's called border trade. Uh, it's, it's, okay. it's, it's not the same as uh, sort of regular, uh, regular trade. And of the product going, coming from of the cargo entering from China into Pakistan, how much is staying in Pakistan and how much is going down to the, like, is, I assume there's a big port in Rawalpindi and then leaving the country. So the port would be in Karachi, the big, there's Oh, the, sorry, yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, Ra yeah. Ra Karachi. No, yeah. I, I, I get the sense that most of it is staying in Pakistan, uh, at least the goods that are, no, mind you, I sort of do want to underscore that only a small percentage of the China-Pakistan trade is overland. The large majority of it, you know, 95% of it, perhaps, perhaps even more, is, um, is, is coming in by sea, uh, into the seaport at Karachi. This is, this is a, only a small portion of, of bilateral trade. There's been talk about how uh, Pakistan could then uh, sort of re-export these goods uh, into, into India, uh, but I mean, these are these are these are very far from becoming reality. I mean, there's there's many many steps uh, which would need to be taken before before that could that could actually happen. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Okay, Georgios. Okay, you can ask your question. Yes, hello, uh, Professor Carrara. My apologies, I'm not going to use the camera because I'm on an outlying small island and today's terribly slow and I'm already missing. The, the, the image tends to freeze. I don't know if you can hear me well. I can, yes, I can. Okay, wonderful. Uh, thank you very much for this fascinating talk. Um, I would imagine uh, that the Karakorum Highway in this project has not done much to improve the relation between Pakistan and India, but that's that's not my main question. Uh, I, I just wanted to ask something that it doesn't really directly relate to your project, but it does relate to mine. If you have heard of any Chinese initiative initiatives to support Buddhism in Gandhara or Buddhist sites in Gandhara. Uh, because I'm actually looking at that in neighboring Himalayan regions and there seems to be a lot of what it's termed nowadays by the theorists as soft power using religion uh, as a soft power to uh, win favors or to win a certain uh, advantage over uh, infrastructure projects. And I'm wondering if there has been any kind of such movement uh, 
in Pakistan. I suppose it's a sensitive subject as well. No, but it shouldn't be. I mean, I haven't. And, and you know, as you were as you were asking the question, I was thinking that I've heard of. Um, so I think the Sri Lankans recently had a ceremony at Gandhara. I believe the South Koreans have um, have made an effort to 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 sort of underscore the importance of Gandhara and as a as a source from as a place from where, where Buddhism sort of moved into into East Asia from. But no, not the. Not the Chinese, and, and and now that now that you ask that question, I I I, I wonder why. I mean, I I I, I don't have I, the the so so part of the answer is no. I mean, not, not to my knowledge, and and I wonder why they haven't done that. It it it's 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 a, it's a, it's a good question. Maybe because Pakistan is predominantly a Muslim country, and maybe that maybe. would necessarily be an advantage. Or... Could be. It could be, um, but but there, I mean, but Pakistan's a paradoxical place. I mean, it's a predominantly Muslim country. Uh, sort of the people's, you know, people's people's uh, understanding of Islam tends to be, you know, a fairly doctrinal sort of you know very you know textual one. But and then that 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 doctrinal, highly textual understanding of Islam finds a lot of traction from within the state. That's that's not that's no surprise. But you know, on the other hand, in recent years, they've also really made an effort to, 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 to build, uh, to, to build connections with the Sikh community in India, and and they've they've uh, they've allowed uh, Indian Sikh pilgrims uh, visa-free access to Kartarpur, which is a, a Sikh uh, holy site. No one expected this to happen, especially when relations between Pakistan and India were so hostile. So. You know, it seems to me like this would be, a, a, you know, a very logical point of, of, of connection between Pakistan and China. Pakistan really, uh, China is extremely important for Pakistan. Let me let me put it that way. Uh, and uh, the 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 only reason I can think of is that, and, and again, I'm speculating over here. I I I I don't know. But the only reason I can think of is that. The Chinese uh, government probably hasn't expressed an interest in this. Uh, I mean, I imagine that the Pakistani state would bend over backwards. Yes. Uh, well, there has been a Chinese delegation that has visited Buddhist sites in Pakistan, uh, the Kiber area. Uh, yeah. But I don't know if anything came out of it. Uh, yeah. Or, yeah. you know, it's, it's uh, yeah. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, that, oh, no. that is an interesting question indeed. Uh, yeah, 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 absolutely. It's, it's worth thinking about more. Yeah. Thank you. My pleasure. Okay, thank you. And Dr. Chen, your question again. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Just a uh, comment on Gregory's uh, comment on religion on um, Pakistan and China. I just recall a case that about several years ago in Peshawar, there was a team of Chinese Protestant missionaries working there. And several of them were uh, were kidnapped, and two were executed by the local insurgents. And mm -hmm. then Chinese banned their back to pick up all those missionaries and banned all Chinese missionaries to Pakistan. Mm -hmm. I mean, banned them to exit China, even not to basically to please the uh, Muslim communities of Pakistan in Peshawar areas, which they have raised campaigns already before, but ignored by China. So is that would that be also mm -hmm. a case that? Uh, 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 that religion plays a role in this way to cement the relationship between China and Pakistan on the BRI projects by prohibiting certain religious flow, which may have negative consequences on the religious dynamic in the local community, in this case in Pakistan. Just raise that. Uh, yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, Dr. Chan, I mean, that's, that's uh, uh, you know, that's, that's, uh, that's an excellent, that's an excellent point. And, and you know, I think, I think the other thing, and, and you're absolutely correct. I think that uh, sort of any missionary or sort of I mean, even even um, even any hint of proselytizing, I think, would be would be sort of taken very negatively uh, in, in 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 Pakistan. So so you know certainly one can one can read this as China being extremely cautious uh, in terms of sort of being mindful of of, of the the sentiments of. Uh, uh, of the Pakistani people, the, the, sort of the one one interesting angle to all of this, I think, is also the fact that um, uh, 
China and the Chinese Communist Party does have party to party contacts with at least the mainstream Islamist parties in, uh, in, in Pakistan too. Uh, and, and really what's, what's, what I find very astonishing is, is, is the degree and the extent to which China enjoys goodwill uh, amongst the, amongst the, 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 the mainstream Islamist parties. And uh, sort of notwithstanding acts of violence by, by the fringe parties or the, the more extremist parties, but the, the mainstream parties at least uh, sort of look very, very favorably upon China. And obviously there's, there's a larger geopolitical story behind all of that, uh, namely that China is, is still seen as, as anti-imperialist and, and uh, as, as, as standing up to the United States. So, so the left in Pakistan and the religious right in Pakistan, uh, then, um, then, then, then sort of sees China as a bulwark against, against, against the West. Uh, but certainly, I think, I think your point is well taken that, that the Chinese have, have uh, or the Chinese officials or the Chinese, as a, as a policy decision, I mean, I think they've been very, very careful and very sensitive to, to popular perceptions uh, in, in Pakistan. Okay. Okay, thank you, Dr. Hassan Kara, to present his fascinating research. And uh, thank everyone for joining the Brain, Faith, Religion and Empire lecture series. Our next seminar will be on November 22nd. We will update our information on our website, Facebook and Twitter. Please pay attention to our website. Look forward to seeing you again. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for, for, for Thank the you. questions. Thank, Thank you. you for the invitation. Thank I, you. I sort of really, yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much, Hassan. Not at all, yeah. not at all. And David, Great I mean, sort of hope, yeah, likewise, hope to run into you uh, sort of at, you know, somewhere sometime. And if you end up coming to Pakistan, drop me a line. You know, we, I'll we, certainly, sort of, I certainly will. Yeah, I hope we, I can, yeah. I really hope, I don't know when, but uh, okay. hope it'll okay. be well, possible. We, Let's stay in well, touch. Sounds good. Sounds good. Thank sounds you. Good. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Yeah. Thank you. I enjoyed this. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.